back to another special edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our first, I guess I can say this because we are now within the one year mark to the next Alberta election. Uh, our first candidate in our window of the election series, and that is the independent candidate for Calgary Fish Creek. And I'm going to make sure I get this right here. Rio Lance. Rio, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Chris Brown. It's an honor to be on the show, too. Today. Well, I, I'm glad that it's an honor for you because sometimes I don't feel like some people think it's an honor, but if you think it's an honor, then I'm happy. Um, Rio, <laughs> if you've listened to the show before, you know the very first question that I'm going to ask for any political candidate, whether they've been in politics for 20 years or 20 minutes, same question, yep. and you are no exception. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? I love this question. Um, my sense of duty comes from, honestly, my Indigenous heritage and my Indigenous family. I feel a lot of times that in politics especially, um, Indigenous voices aren't being either taken seriously or there's not enough of us at the table. And my goal really is, and one of the reasons I want oh, decided to run is to get more Indigenous voices out there. So I would say that's really where my, my duty to serve comes from. Now, it, it, it's, I want to go down that path with you for a few minutes because I want people to know who are listening to this because we have listeners from across Calgary, across Alberta, but even around the country and around the world who will be tuning into this and saying, uh, Indigenous, what does that mean? I know some people might know and might say, oh, that's a, it, it's the first people who were like literally the owners of this land. So can you talk to me about your Indigenous heritage? So I'm an Algonquin from the Greater Golden Lake, which is in Ontario and Quebec. Probably, I would say more than two thirds of it is in Quebec um, and the rest is Ontario. So I grew up on the Ontario side of it, but I do have family members that grew up on the Quebec side of it as well. So I actually lived like an hour away from Ottawa in a small town called Pembroke. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but that's where I was born. And um, I love Pembroke. And then, okay. <laughs> Um, and then I moved, uh, my family actually moved us out, me and my sister out here when we were kids. So I only really lit, I was nine. So I only really spent, you know, half of my childhood in Ontario. So. You, you talked about elevating Indigenous voices and you've chosen a challenging path to do that, to run as a independent uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna. It's kind of gonna be a slight against the uh, the d democratic process that we have currently. But independents don't traditionally get the media coverage that the mainstream parties. And I hate saying mainstream parties, but anyway, why is it important for you to elevate the voices that you feel like are being silenced right now? Um. Well, I think. Uh, in my opinion and from what I've seen, I think a lot of times when uh, Indigenous people of color are elected um, as part of the, the mainstream parties, as you said, I find a lot of them, a lot of parties just elect them as if, oh, this is my, this is our token person. That's how I sort of feel when it comes to the people of color and Indigenous people represented in, in the political parties. Um, and also I feel that, you know, with myself, um, even when I started this journey, and I know we'll get more in depth in it, when I started this journey, I really honestly thought I would land into a party role and it would be much easier. I do understand running as independent. I'm running up against the party machines. I, you know, I have a lot of disadvantages running as an independent, but I think being an Indigenous voice and an in independent to me means that I'll be able to potentially speak on more Indigenous issues and not have to necessarily worry about the party whip or being told by a party leader what I'm allowed and, and not allowed to say type of thing. I, I am glad that you said we're going to talk about it later because we will be getting into some policy questions and burning as an independent, but I want to stick on you for a few minutes here. Um, I want to I want to ask you about your entrance into politics. Um, I, I love this question for a lot of reasons. One, you get to find out what was that moment that you said, I want to get involved and what was the reason you wanted to get involved? And you talked about it a little bit earlier about uh, promoting Indigenous voices, but I want to go in more in depth. Do you remember your first introduction into politics? Was it a election? Was it a 
elected official that you met. What was the first introduction to politics for you? So for me, it's ironic that I've actually got here because I would say for most of my adult life, I never really actually cared a lot about politics. And I think for me, um, for me, it was likely, an, it was mostly an election. It was probably um, just, I started voting actually during the 2017 municipal election in Calgary. And it was like the first time I felt like, oh, you know, this is this is important to get out and vote and and to have to have a voice. Um, I think what pushed me more though to get even deeper into politics was a lot of times, especially once the UCP government won in 2019, I felt a lot of times I would be emailing, you know, MLAs and I would be getting just the generic one one sentence or a couple of words, and I or I would even get blocked uh, for just even asking a simple question. And I know. That that this is an issue for all Albertans. I, I see it online a lot of times where, I'll, you know, the Albertans will say that, you know, they're, they're contacting their MLAs and then they get blocked. So I just felt like as a citizen, I felt like, you know, my voice isn't being taken seriously. How can I make my voice more like more out there? And then that's how I started going, well, maybe I should run for politics. And that's kind of how I got here. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So I want to know why provincial politics? Some might say, uh, okay, as to someone who's relatively new to politics, like you said, you got involved in 2017, you may want to go municipal first. You might want to try school board first, but you've decided, let's go to the big leagues. Let's go to provincial first. So what was the decision behind going provincially and making an announcement of running as an independent provincially? Okay, so I felt, in my honest opinion, I felt that uh, the UCP, once they got elected, I felt that they were really failing a lot of Albertans, and I felt that um, they weren't listening to Albertans, and a lot of people seemed really upset, um, and I felt like, honestly, it it seemed better for me to run provincially than it did, say, federally. I think federally, in my opinion, we've got a pretty solid government, at least at this point, um, in my opinion, and I think that Yes, it's pretty huge to go provincially over a municipal or, or you know, uh, any other smaller government role. But I just felt like we needed more. And again, as I said earlier, we needed more Indigenous voices. We needed more people who are going to speak out about the, the issues that, that um, you know, actually affect people. I can say I can relate to a lot of low income people. I mean, um, years ago, I had to utilize things like the food bank and stuff like that. So I feel like I'm a voice that I can represent a lot of the lower income people. I can under, I understand the struggles that a lot of people are going through. I've been through those same struggles and I feel that that's what would make me a good candidate on a provincial level. So this is going to be a new question that I add into the loop. You are the first candidate in that red zone period of uh, the uh, year before the election. So you are the very first question. So I apologize. This is going to come into the blue. I did not send you this question on the list, but I want to know. You have decided to run for Calgary Fish Creek in the riding of Calgary Fish Creek. It's currently held by Richard Gottfried, uh, the MLA UCP former PC. I'm going to ask every single candidate who comes on my show this one question, because this is how I make my decision if I'm going to vote for somebody or not. Most of the times they don't. But do you live in the riding that you want to represent? I don't, but I lived in, my, in that riding for most of my life. So why do you think you would be the best person to represent that riding? Um, because I grew up in that writing, I've talked to a lot of people in the community. I, a lot of people, you know, I understand the issues that face the Calgary Fish Creek. Um, I've door knocked. I've, you know, even actually before the pandemic, I was, I was briefly door knocking just to sort of see what, um, what issues people felt about the government. Um, you know, even I think February 2020, I was actively really door knocking. Um, there was like a week there I was door knocking and I, and I talked to a lot of people and I was able to ask a lot of different questions and find out what, 
what they are looking for in an MLA and what they want to fight. So in, in most cases, I was able to, you know, find common grounds. There were some times that I was really shocked. They, the writing was very divided, 50-50. Like one of the questions I can say, for example, off the top of my head, I know I had asked them about climate change because I, I am somebody who definitely fights for that. But my writing is 50-50 on it. 50% don't believe in it, 50% do. So it's interesting that some of the, the, the topics are, are split, right? in the middle so it's a very unique writing and I will agree that it is a very I always say it's a very conservative rich writing because there's always been you know a UCP a, a PC or a wild rose in that writing so it is a very conservative writing but I am I think the one beautiful thing about being independent is you can sort of alter uh, the things that you want to represent based on your constituents you don't have to just stay in one line of thinking. You are the king of segues because you perfectly set up the next set of questions. It's like you prepared for this <laughs> or something. Um, Rio, I wanna know, you talk about you going out, knocking on doors, asking the questions, learning about the issues from the residents of Calgary Fish Creek. Uh, I know the pandemic has changed the way that you connect with people, but what are, you, you talked about climate change, but I wanna know what are some issues that are affecting the people of Calgary Fish Creek? So I would say uh, w one of the issues we can start off with is the lack of support. Some of them feel the lack of support of uh, the government and uh, the government failing them um, and getting rid of some of them have even voiced to me about losing doctors. So healthcare being a, a thing um, and lack of support sometimes within the education system, um, as well as, um, you know, just feeling like there's not a lot of representation for, for the writing. Um, uh, and this is, these are words from, from people I talked to was some of them are kind of hoping that we can move past the whole white male representation in government and have more people of color and indigenous voices. So those would be some of the things that I, I noticed were big issues for that writing. Well, you know what the next thing is. Let's dive into some of these topics because as <laughs> yeah. an independent, you're not bound by a party platform. You have the ability to have the ability, you have the ability to ebb and flow on certain issues. If you hear something better than what you have put on paper, you're willing to adapt. That's what an independent does. So I want to know, and we'll start with climate change because it is an important issue to you. And that, that was the first one you brought forward. So I want to I want to go in the order here. So why is climate change important? And as an independent, what would you like to see the government do to ensure that we properly address this issue? Um, so I think climate change is, is an issue for the whole world. I don't think it's just obviously just in Alberta. Um, but if we're putting it on an Alberta scale, I mean, I think, you know, the, the floods that Calgary had in 2013, the wildfires, um, you know, and droughts. I mean, we, we Alberta is known to have droughts and we could still have droughts in the future as climate change gets worse, you know. So I think that's my biggest thing is I think focusing on how we can find use cleaner energy. Um, I know Alberta loves oil and gas, and it's one of the things that I, I, I do support it, but I think that we do need to still find other cleaner energies. So if that means using more solar power and wind power and uh, electrical cars, you know, these would be probably things that I would probably push for the government um, and hope that, you know, they, they listen. Because I know that, that wind and solar power can really cut our carbon footprint. Um, and I know, I think, I believe the NDP said something about doing something by 2050, but I feel that we should be doing something much sooner than 2050 because when you say 2050 it's almost like you're just saying oh let's just wait around for the next 15 20 years and i don't think we really can continue to wait this is something that we need to do yesterday in my opinion so it's, it needs to be done real, relatively soon you you talk about wind and solar and you mentioned the big elephant into the room and that is oil and gas um, yeah. There will be a lot of people who will be making up their minds based on how the candidates view the oil and gas sector, as you've put it. And I think everyone knows oil and gas was the backbone of the Alberta economy for many years. Some want to transition away from it. Some want to cut it off tomorrow. Um, 
for the voters who are voting on the issue and only issue is oil and gas, what message do you say to them to say, give me a chance because while I, we see a transition away from oil and gas, I'm still a supporter of the oil and gas industry. If you are, if not, then tell me why you aren't. <laughs> um, I think for me, I, I definitely support the oil and gas industry, but I think that we need to come up with newer ideas too. We can't just put all of our eggs in one basket. I think Alberta has put our, our eggs in oil and gas, like you said, it has been the backbone of our province. But I think that it's it, it's somewhat failing us. It's helping us and failing us at the same time. So I think, you know, in, in my opinion, I mean, Alberta has been part of Canada for 117 years, I think it is now. And I think that what, what might've worked centuries ago or decades ago, sorry, um, might not be working now right so I'm definitely a, a supporter on it and I think it's something I would continue to still want to see for Alberta but I just don't want everything to be put into oil and gas um, for Alberta I want us to think the future and I want us to think of other ways that you know that we can make money from and and have a better future overall right so yeah no understandable the next one the next topic i want to talk about and this is my favorite conversation because this is this is where i get to ask the hard hitting question it's not really hard hitting but it's about representation you talked about true representation and that was an issue that you heard from at the doors and when you're talking to people in calgary fish creek how would you do better <laughs> how would you um... represent all Calgary Fish Creek residents, because, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to extend my question a little bit here because I want to, I want to set this up correctly. In your statement, you said that you have a riding that is 50, 50 split on climate change. 50% don't believe it. 50% believe it. How do you represent all of the people of your riding on issues where it is such a black, black and white scenario here where it's either you agree with it or you don't. So how do you represent yeah. everyone? Um, I mean, I think this is actually really good. I'm glad you asked us because I think that I, I totally agree that yes, maybe you can't represent 100% of the people all the time. And one of the things that I've actually said before, um, I think on a different podcast I was on was that um, it, even the people who don't vote for me, I want to still have conversations with those people. So if I was magically elected and won, I want to have conversations with the people who might have voted UCP, NDP, Greens, Liberals, and, and so on. Because I think that there's usually always a reason why they vote the way they do. And I think that I want to be able to be that person that tries to understand everybody, even if they might not align with me or agree, agree with what I stand for. I want to try to represent as many people as possible, right? And I, I want to have those, those hard conversations because if they don't vote for me, then they obviously don't think I'm the best suited for, for the position. But at the same time, if I'm now their MLA, I want to be, still have that, those conversations conversations and not feel like they don't they're not valued or that you know I'm going to just send them a generic email and, and be off with, with my day of course I can't save everyone or help everyone obviously I'm one person but I think that would be my biggest asset was that is that I'm willing to adapt to everybody and also find out why those people might have not vote for me and still try to find a common ground I think when it comes to the climate change though and I said it to my campaign manager is that if there's ever an issue that it's divided it just lets me know that i have to be the one to make the final say of we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show with a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews you can help continue this show for as little as three dollars a month your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership click the link in the show notes and back the show today well, welcome back from that very sporadic commercial break that we just had as you might notice if you're watching this live via youtube um the setup that Rio's in is a little bit different. We've had some technical difficulties, but we're back. And that's the great <laughs> thing about technology. We can always just go to our phones. Um, exactly. We are talking about uh, representation, representation. And I want to ask the follow-up question to part of the answer that you kind of gave us. And then okay. we'll get us back on track here. And that is, 
you, you, you were talking about you are the final say. At the end of the day, you are the final say. Now, this is the hypothetical I pose to you. Your writing comes to you and the overwhelming majority say to you, we want you to vote this way on a certain issue, whether it be budget, whether it be a certain bill. But deep down inside of you, uh, your, uh, your own opinion says that you need to vote another way than what the majority of your constituents want. As an independent, you are not whipped. So you do not have the ability, you do not have to go with what the party wants. How do you balance what the needs of the majority of the constituents against the needs that you believe are right? Okay, so I think when I cut out, I was trying to say, I don't know if you had heard this, I think I was trying to say that um, I would only give myself the final say if if my constituents were split 50-50 on an issue. That that's what I meant on that part. Yeah. I think if a, I think if a majority of my constituents came to me about an issue, um, I would likely likely go that way. One of the things that I've been really saying a lot, whether it's on social media or in other interviews, is that. I want to give back to the people's voices. I want people to have their voices. So as an independent, as you said, you're, you're, not, you're not whipped by the party leader. You're not told what you have to say. So I think honestly, even if necessarily, I might not agree with, with an issue. If, I'm, if a majority of my constituents came to me about an issue and said, this is how they want me to vote or on a certain issue, then absolutely, I will definitely go the way that the majority wants. Because the thing is, is that I want to try to um, appeal to as many people as possible and have, um, you know, have as many people's voices be heard. So I think that's where I would stand on, on that. There is a lot going on right now. This is going to be airing the day before the leadership review for Jason Kenney. So this week we find out if Jason Kenney is still the premier, literally as of Thursday. Um, I want to ask about the party discipline part of this whole scenario here. You are one person. I know small voices can make big differences. We've seen that with uh, Mike Schreiner in Ontario, the Ontario Green Party leader. We saw that with Elizabeth May. But what gives you hope that in the, the two-party system that we currently have, where a lot of people are so partisan now that you will be able to rise above it and represent the people of Calgary Fish Creek in a way that they need it, but also deserve it because they're not going to get that partisan politics that might come with a NDP or a liberal or an Alberta party or a UCP. Um, I think for me, um, my hope is that, you know, more MLA start seeing that um, and even the party leaders, the ones that, you know, are making the decisions is I, I hope that they see that we really, honestly, we really need to move past the partisanship and we need to move past the us versus them and, and always going back and forth and pointing fingers at each other. I think what we need to do is really start um, coming together and evaluating the things we have in common. Um, being one voice, yes, absolutely, uh, and especially uh, in Alberta with 87 seats can be very challenging because you don't have the party leader, you don't have other people representing your party or, or who you are. So that definitely can be a huge challenge. But my hope is too that Albertans also move away from the two party system. And I hope that they start electing more parties because I'm willing to, to have conversations with the NDP and UCP, but I'm also hoping there's other voices there too uh, from other parties because I think we need, we really do need more representation, but I think we really need to move past that whole party system idea. Um, uh, as I've said before, it's all about how things might have worked decades ago might not be working now. And I don't say I don't say like I hate the party system. I think I understand why we have a party system and and the purpose of the party system. But 
I think a lot of times the parties get very blinded by their policies and they just want to focus on what matters to them and no, no one else. And the other thing I find with Alberta is we've always had a majority government. If you look at the history of all of our governments, we've always had a majority government and majority governments really power trip because they know that they can pretty much get away with anything. And we're seeing that a lot with the UCP having, having a majority 60 three seats or something like that, um, having all this power and just doing whatever they want. My hope too, honestly, and I know that this is the hope probably for some other Albertans, is that we have a minority government because I feel as an independent, um, my voice could probably be stronger under a minority government, especially if they need other people to, to agree with their party and agree with their policies, right? So that would be some of my hopes. You, the last area I want to talk about is Indigenous issues. Uh, this is very close to your heart, and I want to start by... Um, I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off. We have, uh, I say that uh, uh, not glibly, but I want to just we'll say this. Um, there are graveyards being found across this province on a daily basis not a daily basis i shouldn't say daily basis but on a monthly basis that every time it's in the news we always say we're going to do better and then the next news story comes out and then we forget and then it mm -hmm. happens again and then we just we don't get shocked as much as the last time um, I know up in Girard, where the last gra uh, unmarked uh, gravesite of the uh, children of residential schools was, I've been to that area. I ran in a campaign in that area, so I know it quite well. How do we get people to take this issue more serious? And I mean that sincerely because I try to talk about it. It just it doesn't seem to be getting the traction that it did when the first grave site was found in Kamloops. And I, and I, again, again, I hate that I have to say it that way, but it's true. I don't see the outpouring of our, literally we killed these people, these children and we need to like, sorry. How do no, we get I, to understand this issue more and actually take it serious? <sighs> You know, honestly, in, in my, and this is my opinion, and I mean, I, I do talk to other Indigenous people, but um, I think honestly, it, it's sort of, it is sad. It's sad what you said, like the first time it happened, it, it got a lot of attention. And it seems every time that there's more graves being um, found, it's almost like, oh, like, oh, it's just another story. Like, that's, that's what it seems that the vast majority of people are like. And I think honestly, what it comes down to is really just listening, listening to Indigenous people and, and, and honestly taking them more seriously. You know, um, Indigenous people flood our jails, for example, and, um, and this isn't just in Alberta, but all across Canada. And it's the profiling that, that happens for Indigenous people is, is very sad. My, my partner actually is very more visible Indigenous than what I am. And we can walk into stores and we get profiled all the time. If he's carrying the bags, somebody, a worker's following us. If I carry the bag, the workers won't follow us. And that's, that's the thing is we really honestly I have to move away from all this, this way of thinking and this genocide. But the problem is, is that for so long, people have been taught the way that they've been taught. So it's almost like it's hard to tell people to, to unlearn something that they thought was the reality their whole life. You know, um, even if we go into my family, like my uh, grandmother was in um, the day residential school, which means that she got to go home at the end of the day, but she was in a residential school during the day. And she only told me her story when she was 80. She's going to be 89 next month. So she held on to this for, for several decades before starting opening up to people. And I know her story is not the only one. There's so many stories uh, like this that are out there. And I think, honestly, that would be my opinion is we just need to really listen more and take it more seriously and and i understand media in general this isn't just with indigenous media likes to to show us things and, and it gets us all hyped up and then 24 48 or so many hours later people forget about it right and there 
have been Indigenous people like Jody Wilson-Rabel, for who's very well known, we can say, who has brought up this stuff. And I think sometimes I see, I've seen, um, you know, Indigenous candidates who bring up these issues. And even on a government level, they're not taking them seriously. So I don't get why that's happening but that pattern is is really if the government's doing it then society thinks that they can do that too right so that would be my biggest advice is we really just need to start taking this seriously and and I, listening to, to their voices i'm gonna ask a, a kind of a touchy question but i think you're in a mindset that you can answer it is Alberta a racist province? Because when you just said to me, when you just said to me that you and your partner go into a store and you get profiled, I know from my uh, son-in-law or my, uh, my nephew, I should say, he he's black and he drove a car and the Calgary Police Service pulled them over and they said, how did you afford this car? It was his mother's car, but he was profiled because black kid and nice car they're going to assume that's bad and i and i hate to ask the question but it is it is a question that i ask all the time and i don't know the answer because again i i'm 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 white as white can be i get a sunburn in the middle of winter for god's sakes but <laughs> i i i've never walked in someone else's shoe so i cannot tell you how uh, that feels so from someone who feels this discrimination, who gets profiled when they go out with their partner, do you feel like Alberta is a racist province or do you kind of hope for the best? Um, honestly, I, I do think that Alberta is a racist province. I think that the, the whole country is, in my opinion, but I definitely think Alberta is a very racist uh, province. Well, how do we I change think that? On it, um, I know I'm asking you to solve like basically the biggest issue that is facing a lot of people right now, but how do we start that conversation? And as an independent MLA, what would be your first priority to address this? Because I think it takes one match to light a fire. So all you need is one person to start the conversation. So how are you going to start that conversation? Um, you know, I think it would be more just getting the government in general to um, maybe start using, as we said, using more uh, representation, Indigenous people of color's voices, um, getting them um, more involved in government, getting them, uh, whether it's running or being part of, um, you know, different um committees and stuff you know I think if we have honestly more representation even if it means and I know this might be an unpopular opinion for some people even if it means taking regular citizens from different writings who represent these groups and having them be a committee uh, for the government as well to address the the racism in the country in the province and also you know try to get people to, you know, feel more equal and, and feel like their voices are being heard. But, you know, the thing is, and I, and I see this with, with a lot of people, especially social media, um, people of color and ind indigenous voices, when they, when they seem to um, write stuff on social media, like Twitter and stuff, I always seem to find that, that white, and I'm sorry to say this, but, but straight white cis males always seem to get more of the attention than, the, than those other groups of people. And I think honestly, that would be one thing I would push for or hope for is getting more of these committees, or like I said, getting more, uh, allowing even, even if parties elect Indigenous people, allowing these, these candidates to talk more about the, the racism and uh, the Indigenous uh, issues that, fa that are faced across this province. So I think even allowing more people to talk that are Indigenous and or, you know, people of colour, having them uh, and, and Black people and having them have more of a, a say than just, oh, you're part of our party and, you know, we, we're diverse. Well, you know, that doesn't really give you, make you diverse just because you have those people. Let's let those people talk. Let's ha have those people bring up these issues and, um, you know, hope for a better future that, you know, racism isn't an issue, right? So, that would be the direction I would go. 
I'm so happy you're willing to chat about this because I think you're you're absolutely right. Because, and I I will be the first to admit I have tendencies to be colorblind and be uh, sort of have blinders on when I invite people on the show, and I don't want to seem that way. For a few weeks, I was being accused of being transphobic because I hadn't had a transgendered person on the show. So I want to give my platform to people who don't have the platform to give it to themselves. And I think everyone has the, the platform to give to themselves, whether it be Twitter, whether it be whatever you want to say. But I agree that we need to start having that conversation and we need to bring people together of racialized communities. And I'm so happy you're willing to answer that question. So thank you so much, Rio, for that. I am so honored that you're able to have that, that we are able to have this conversation um i'm just cautious of time because i know that you have other things that you need to get to as well but my last question is kind of a open-ended question and that is with a year left until election we're expecting sometime in may 2023 it will be called what do you do from now until election day to connect with voters to engage with voters, to get your message out. What are you doing? How are you contacting people? Because the pandemic is, as much as people might want to think it is, it's not over yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's really not. Um, I think for me, like the thing that, um, and it's one thing I would want to change, actually, the thing about being an independent, I don't know if a lot of people know this or not, is you can't really um, campaign as much as the, the parties can. You have to actually wait, usually till the election year to really put yourself more forward. So really, for me, what I'm what I was doing is more just contacting people. A lot of the people who I talked to uh, before the pandemic, they, um, you know, I gave them my personal email and they were able to um you know, email me on different stuff. I've done some where I've invited them and done like virtual, like town hall meetings, if you will. So because of the pandemic, I wanted to make it as safe as possible. So I mean, and if I if my team and I do go door knocking, we do really still, you know, keep people's health in mind and safety and stuff. Um, because I am seeing a lot of the the parties, especially door knocking. And uh, it's like they too are acting like the pandemic is over. And it's not just UCP candidates, I see even the NDP doing it. So it's it's just ironic to me. Because I see that as well. Don't worry, you're not you're not the only one. And I, <laughs> okay. I wave so the I mean, finger towards that certain party who they know who they are because they were all at my wedding. <laughs> 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 so I think that uh, you know because it, if you're going to wear a mask in the legislation and then you're going to go to people's doors and act like the pandemic is over it's very misleading <laughs> um, so I think for me if I do the door knocking I definitely like I said I wear the mask and I keep my distance because again I want to keep everyone's safety is number one priority when I do that um, so yeah I'm just trying to engage as much as I can of course as the, we get closer to the election year, I'll be able to engage more. And then of course, when the election is called, I'll be able to actually even, you know, put some of my signs out and stuff, which will be pretty huge. But I, I do uh, have the, the traditional Calgary question that I have to ask right now, though. Okay. When, okay. Are, we, when are we expecting the Calgary Stampede pancake breakfast by independent M MLA candidate Rio Lance? Because if you don't do a pancake breakfast, do you really technically run an election? <laughs> Yeah, true enough. I, I haven't even thought of doing a pancake breakfast. So that's a good question. I mean, um, everyone else seems to do it. So uh, yeah, definitely. If it's something that comes up, I would definitely post it on my social media so people can see. Um, I will say too, um, I don't, I have a website, but it's not up yet. It's in the works. My IT person is working on it. I've got like such amazing people on my team. But um, again, like I said, once things um, are, I'm allowed to announce more stuff. I'll definitely um, post my website. Right now, obviously, I think really the only way people can reach me is is through Twitter. Um, and uh, I would give my email, but I'm not gonna give it to the whole world. So um, definitely that would be the only way right now, but eventually I will have more ways that people can reach me for sure. And for those who have listened before, you know what I'm about to say, the links to Rio's uh, Twitter account, show notes show the notes scroll down 
if you're watching this on YouTube, click on the link, go follow Rio if you're living Calgary Fish Creek, or even if you don't, if you live in Alberta, follow them. Because in Alberta, anyone can donate during election period um, in Alberta. Um, also, if you're listening to this on any of the audio podcasts, uh, Spotify uh, pullover, if you're listening to this in a car, do, do not text and drive or do not podcast and drive. Uh, and check out the show notes. Wait till you get home. Um, Rio, my very last question to you, and this is the big one. This is this is going to give you two minutes or as long as you need. Why should you be the next MLA for Calgary Fish Creek? <laughs> this is the elevator pitch. This is what you're doing at the doors in a year time. But why should yeah, you exactly. be the next MLA for Calgary Fish Creek? Um, I think I've said it a lot, but I think for me, like I said, being the, the Indigenous voice, being a voice of reason, um, understanding uh, what it is like to, to utilize things like the food bank and uh, what it's like to have a low income and uh, the struggles that, that come with, with all those things. Um, and I'm very transparent. Like, I think I allow people to, to see who I am. I don't try to hide anything. I'm pretty like out there. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to do type of thing. Um, and I really think we need more politicians like that. Um, you know, I don't have a politician voice, I guess, because I, I say I do hear some people when they talk, I always feel they have a, a certain voice. Uh, it's almost seems scripted. And I'm very not scripted. I'm very, I'm out there. <laughs> and yeah, so I think being transparent is, is what people sh would want in a candidate, I would think. And uh, somebody, like I said, who's willing to even work with the people who don't vote for me, because I understand we're all different and we all have different views so you know but sometimes there's that middle ground and it's that middle ground that I, I would hope to achieve with anyone who uh, doesn't vote for me. Well Rio I want to thank you so much for doing this this has been an honor and a pleasure uh, I hope you enjoyed the last half hour 40 minutes because I certainly did um, um, but thank you thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm sorry so about the, te the technology stuff over here too today. <laughs> for those, the magic of podcasts, they didn't even notice, but yes, <laughs> totally. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank Rio for uh, joining us today for this great edition of the Cross Board Interviews with uh, Chris Brown. Uh, like I said, if you want to follow them, uh, if you want to follow them, scroll down into the show notes, click on their Twitter uh, handle. It will take you to Twitter and you can follow them. Um, and I will say, as I've said in numerous episodes during the month of May, just to give a personal plug here, May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Uh, during the month of May, we raise awareness for uh, people suffering with brain tumors. For those who know me, uh, I've been suffering with one for the last two and a half years. So if you can, please donate to the uh, Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. It is an important foundation that helps a lot of families. So please, 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 if you can, donate, and it'd be greatly appreciated. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, for listening to this. As I've said in numerous uh, podcasts as well, put down the phone and go have a conversation with somebody unless you can, unless your audio isn't working and then pick up your phone and call somebody, but have a conversation with somebody because it does make our society and our democratic process much better than yelling and fighting on Twitter. So without further ado, thank you everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day and talk to you guys later.